Philip, thank you for coming in for part two of our of our interview. Your work is just outstanding, so foundational to really not not only today, but also many years over decades in the past and all of the inventions and the creation you've done, but also into the future. Really, uh, you know, semiconductor technology and the foundational work you're doing and really drives everything else in essence, right? So that's why um, I wanted to get more about, you know, where your work is going. We just didn't have enough time for the, in the for, uh, first MUU. So we're gonna continue in that journey. So again, thank you for coming in. Sure, happy to be here, thank you. So we're gonna jump right into it. Uh, I wanted to get into more of your your work uh, that's current. Uh, uh, you know, we talked about your carbon electronics. You've been doing that for decades and uh, you've been realizing that into fruition and you, you, you know, work with foundries and things on that already. And we talked about 2 day uh, 2D layered materials already. Uh, we, touched on things like uh, parts of uh, non-volatile memory, but also on monolithic 3D integration. But let's continue in <laughs> the work you're doing. And, and the next topic is on wireless implantable biosensors. <laughs> I just love this topic, you know, so. Yeah, so this is a uh, kind of like a patch project uh, that I've been working on for a number of years with my collaborator, Professor Ada Poon at Stanford. And she's a wireless expert and uh, has been applying her skills to uh, not only uh, wireless communications, which many people may be familiar with, but also on um, uh, the use of wireless communications in uh, bio sensing and uh, communications with bio with bio with uh, with uh, biomedical applications and uh, at. Now, perhaps you may want to uh, interview uh, Professor Poon. Also, she's uh, done fantastic work in this field. And so this PET project uh, started uh, kind of in, a, in an interesting way. I met somebody from the medical school uh, in the Vice Cafe uh, in our department headquarters building in the Packard building. And... Um, and he said, I asked him, what are you, I asked him, what is he doing? He said, oh, I'm working on with cells and things like that. And he asked me what I'm doing. And oh, I make chips and chips are very small. So I started asking him, how big are your cells? He said, well, oh, cells are maybe like tens of microns, sometimes even bigger. And he said, wow, tens of microns is really huge. I can literally <laughs> put a ton of transistors inside your cell. And he said, what? Is it, is it possible? <laughs> And so, so that started that conversation, and um, and then I realized that uh, the uh, nanofabrication methods have been so advanced um, uh, that nowadays that you can the devices that you make, the transistors and the memory and the wireless communications means that you can have are so small compared to compared with the size of a cell, so you can actually fit. A uh, whole chip inside a cell, and so the, of course I'm no wireless expert. So I found my colleague uh, Ada Poon, who also found that idea intriguing, and so the two of us, and also the person from the medical school, uh, uh, Demi Atkin, uh, started working on this topic. And uh, meanwhile, there was another professor at the medical school, uh, Professor uh, Mike McConnell, who was a cardiologist and also interested, intrigued in the, by this idea. So kind of on and off, we collaborated and 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 because they this really requires a medical knowledge and some knowledge about biology. So I started say, okay, how do, we, how do we make, put a chip inside a cell? And, and we searched the literature and, and lo and behold, nobody had done this before. And uh, they have been uh, electronics um, in and uh, in and around an organ, for example, you probably hear about uh, uh, endoscope pill camera. You can swallow a pill and then you can take pictures inside your gut. But those are not at the organ level. And um, and you can also have things that exist around the tissue level. Like, for example, you can have uh, brain implants that are right next to the tissues and things like that. But it seems that nobody has done anything to put electronics inside a cell. So we say, wow, that's interesting. Let me give it a try. 
And so uh, we started, I uh, started working with uh, Ada Kuhn on designing chips that can go inside the cell and can also wirelessly communicate with it. And uh, of course, once you put it inside a cell, you cannot kill the cell, otherwise this you know, defeats the whole purpose. <laughs> Why do you want to put it in there? <laughs> and so the, um, we, uh, we find a way to put chips inside a cell and um, and actually monitor how the cell would uh, behave after the chips goes in there. And uh, we actually did a lot of uh, uh, cell imaging to determine that the cell function kind of normally. And also the cell can also divide. So uh, through the normal cell division process, of course, the cell divides and the chips don't divide by cell. Yeah. <laughs> that would be another miracle. <laughs> uh, so the and so that that that's how like the beginning of the project, and um, we are uh, at a point where I think we could uh, then put a chip inside a cell and communicate with it. And the next thing we want to do is to affect the behavior of the cell and. Uh, for example, uh, having some, a means to maybe release a drug or something like that uh, re remotely, wirelessly, and so that the cell behavior would be affected. And that would be sort of like a means to do biology with uh, kind of change the course of biology, how, how the uh, cell uh, works uh, without going through a uh, kind of with with electronic means. Let me put it this way: with electronic means. And previously, the way we affect how cells behave have always been through chemical signaling, chemical means, and biological means, but have never been through ele electrical means. And so, having this electrical means uh, perhaps would open up a new uh, way to interact with uh, biology at a cell level and perhaps help us find more uh, information about how the cell functions. And so that's kind of like the motivation of the work. You know, that's, that's really a, a, such a novel application because you're, you're such, you have such expertise in the nanofabrication, right? <laughs> so, and, and then when, when you know, this uh, researcher talks about uh, a cell size, you're thinking, well, that's actually quite big. <laughs> yeah, it's very big. <laughs> And yeah, you could easily put in, uh, you know, different sort of uh, chip-like structures in there and things like that, right? Because of, and then, the, uh, I mean, and this is uh, precision medicine. This is definitely personalized medicine as well. Yeah. The combination, and it's translational, <laughs> which means you could do something useful. So I think that's amazing. And in fact, I, I mentioned earlier, I just came off an interview with the chairman of the Terra Secondary Institute of Biomedical Innovation, and they're working at sort of this micro level, but I think your work would be so perfect in the work that they're doing anyway. So I'll mention your, your work to them um, because they're working at, at these very small scales as well, but you're even smaller. So <laughs> I think that's... Yeah. Yeah, currently we're working with another professor at uh, UCSF, uh, Professor Wallace Marshall. And uh, our goal is to demonstrate that the chip can release a drug and change the, how the cell behave. And so that's our next goal uh, uh, of, uh, of this research. And I think that if, if we're successful, it would bring about a sea change in how we can interact with cells. Because previously, it's only through biological or chemical means. You have to create a new cell. You have to make something. You have to put some chemicals in it. But now we can do it through remotely using uh, electrical means. Yeah, and I can see how that could work with... Um, I just did an interview earlier this uh, week with uh, Shiling Shen. Mm. And he's able to create something called a microorganosphere, which is like a droplet representing... Um, an actual uh, sort of like a replica of, of a tumor, but the surrounding cells and encase it in this sort of membrane. Um, and then they, he can replicate it. He can automate that. And then he can also um, uh, do uh, standardized procedures for imaging and so on. And he's created a company called Xylus, but he's also working with the uh, Terasaki Institute. But what if you could insert your biosensors within these organospheres 
And then we, even within the organospheres, within the actual cells that are occurring within the organospheres, I think, uh, well, I know that there would be um, just an, a, 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 an exponential increase in the ability to kind of fine tune what they're doing in their work. So <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's amazing. Uh, I'm definitely going to share some of the, what you're doing with uh, with these uh, people that I know as well. So, okay. So, you know, my, my mind is on fire from just from the wireless and plantable biosensors. Okay. Let's get to directed self-assembly. Um, can you talk about that work? Yeah, this is a very interesting uh, direction, which I don't expect myself to go into, but somehow I went into it. Uh, the story went back many years when I was at IBM. Uh, there were two researchers, uh, Chuck Black and Catherine Gowini, who uh, picked up this problem of using uh, a self-assembly to pattern uh, small features. Uh, what it means is that, in particularly in this case, is the use of something called block copolymer. Uh, the block copolymer consists of two strands of polymers that are tied together at one end. And they are, uh, in general, they have different chemical properties. And uh, so they like to be with each other and they don't like to be with one another. So as you, uh, it becomes, uh, as you spin cast these, uh, Block copolymer uh, solutions on, uh, let's say, a piece of wafer, and and new them provide some energy for them to self assemble. They would form features. They would form the lines or holes and the type features, and from which you can then selectively remove one of the polymers and and use the other one as a mask, uh, and then to go forth and pattern fine features. In, uh, for making a uh, variety of structures, uh, for example, like in, in making some semiconductor chips. And so these features are nanometer scale. They are maybe like anywhere from uh, 10 nanometer to slightly bigger and so on, and depending on what polymer you use. So that has been going on for quite a uh, and, uh, and my two colleagues at IBM at the time, I was the manager, their manager, they have this interesting idea. And they started some research in this area. I saw that uh, I saw that kind of interesting. So when I came to Stanford, I continued that line of research. Um, but I started a different in a uh, in a different direction in the sense that uh, we uh, previously all this work was done mostly by chemists, and uh, and they were more in, they are interested in the in the properties of the polymer, how they assemble. How do you make it large area uniform so that uh, everything is the same, which are which are really important. At the same time, I look at how we, if we want to use it for semiconductor chip manufacturing, uh, oftentimes the chips, the, the features on a chip, are not uniform. They they just they are <laughs> randomly designed. A designer would draw a feature here, draw a feature there. So if you have features that are completely uniform, then you cannot make a chip out of it because there's no uh, no uh, no um, uh, variety of features. And so there needs to be a way to uh, direct the assembly. That's why it's called directed self-assembly, not just self-assembly. There needs to be a way to direct the assembly in such a way that if you want a feature here, then you have a feature here. If you don't want a feature here, you don't want it. Uh, and you, don't, you don't have it. So, the, um, and we, and uh, not just uh, ourselves, but broadly, broader community realized that we need these direct directions and those directions can come from a, a variety of sources, such as having a, a, a topolo topographical guiding uh, features, such as let's say you build a trough in here. And within that trough, you do the self-assembly or you put start down some uh, com uh, chemicals so that you could, uh, 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 align these features preferentially on these uh, chemicals. So we, uh, my student and I work on this uh, quite a bit and develop ways to uh, assemble these uh, these features and develop a way to, uh, to utilize this in semiconductor manufacturing. In particular, in semiconductor manufacturing, there are um, what we call canonical features. The features that oftentimes repeated many, many times. 
And uh, if you look at a chip design, uh, it's not completely random. There are some features that shows up very often and, uh, and you could uh, compose your entire chip out of these uh, a, a small set of features. And so then, the, the, then we realized that, hey, you could, you don't have to uh, uh, do set the rest of self-assembly for an infinite uh, possibilities of features that you build and build. But if you look carefully on a chip, you can have a limited set of features that you need, need, need that you can uh, learn on learn how to build, and then using those canonical features, you can compose the entire chips. So similar to you, you have twenty six letters of the alphabet. You can write anything you want uh, out of these uh, twenty six letters of the alphabet. So all we need to know is to learn how to write how to write the alphabet, and then you can compose the entire you know tale of two cities, right, for example. So the so that's what we're working on, and that's a um and the industry for a while has been very active in this field, um and um that the, all technology comes and go for a while, that then the, um. Then the extreme ultraviolet uh, uh, EUV lithography came along, and uh, that was a that was uh, lithography te technology able to patent features that the originally the, that those direct self assembly are able to access. So the, um, there was some uh, so the direct self assembly has not yet been introduced in the manufacturing because the the alternative is actually. Uh, doing much better. Uh, but now going forward, even with the EOV lithography, which can be pattern very fine features, uh, there are the, um, the, the features that are very small at an animated scale are not very perfect. So uh, now the industry is look, going back to look at these direct self assembly and say, can we use this buckle polymer uh, uh, to uh, repair the features. If you have a feature that is uh, patterned but not quite perfect, we have a kind of rough edges. Maybe you can use the direct self assembly to make the edges smoother because the polymers, the length of the polymer is fixed by the polymer itself. So the so that the, the expectation is that with the direct self assembly, one would be able to uh, build uh, small features that are more uniform and uh, and uh, with much better uh properties than just using the uh, you know, lithography alone so that's uh, kind of uh, it's still a very active uh, research topic uh, right now in industry and uh for university research uh for myself i kind of uh, left this field a little while ago because this is getting to a point where industry has picked up this thing, this uh, topic already and it gets to a point where you need to show uniformity over a 300 millimeter wafer for a billion transistor. That's something that universities cannot do. <laughs> <laughs> so the, I guess our contribution to that, to that has kind of uh, has has come and gone, and then the industry has picked up those uh, basic concepts already. You know, it's interesting though. You know, your work though laid the foundation for this movement in industry to move to this uh, entirely uh, much more precise level, um, especially as you're getting smaller and smaller, right? So, uh, it, again, uh, just uh, transformational work and uh, really setting the industry uh, into the future. Uh, you, you also have this area of device modeling. Can you talk about that? Yeah, um, device modeling is very important for our um, to our uh, device technology uh, devices refers to like transistors memory and so on and so forth um, um for the modelers uh, but, uh, the, we often say that if we don't understand the physics you cannot model <laughs> so doing modeling is more than just trying to produce a model of the physical world but really to have a very deep understanding of the physical system that you're working on. So we've done models on transistors, we've done model on memory. Uh, for example, I told you about the common energy transistors before. So I had students who work on uh, transistor models for the carbon energy transistors. That requires us to have a deep understanding of the physics of the carbon energy and also uh, Stemming from that understanding, you need to be able to abstract that 
very complex physics into a simple enough model that number one captures the physics and number two are simple enough so you can use it very easily so that you don't have to run the simulation for uh, three days to get an answer. <laughs> and so that, that's sort of get, getting the speed and also the accuracy are important. So we've done model computer models for carbon energy transistors and every, all our models are open source out in the web and uh, we put our models in uh, a, a National Science Foundation supported uh, hub called NanoHub, where they, this is basically a repository of models, and we put our models up there, and literally tens of thousands of people have downloaded the models, those models and used it for their research and cited those works. We also have done a, uh, a model on um, on RM, the resistor switching memory that I we touched upon last time. Uh, the RM model uh, I've done in collaboration with my collaborators in Peking University, Professor Jin Tong Kang, who have uh, kindly sent a number of students to my group as graduate students. And uh, so we have a very tight, we had a very tight collaboration over the years and uh, on the models from understanding about the physics of the resistance switching event and then translating that and abstracting that understanding into simple equations. And uh, those models are actually also used by many people in the field, including some companies that I know of, that they're using these models for their own uh, product development as well. So, so that's kind of like the device model, two examples of the device models. And of course, in between, we do a lot of different kinds of modeling, but those are two kind of more, exam more um, visible examples. I, I, again, uh, you know, it improves uh, or speeds up the research time, right? When you have models. Uh, oh, yeah, it does, because you need to be able to not only work at a single device level, but also be able to string those devices together in a circuit and in a system. And uh, without a model of the, of the device, either the memory or the logic transistors, you will not be able to know what the circuit would look like or how the whole system would perform. For example, in the carbon energy transistors, uh, at the transistor level, we all know there's like uh, how much current drive you have and how much power you consume at a single device. But then the next question is, okay, let's say you have this transistor working in the system. You have, let's say you, you build your entire iPhone out of a trans, out of the carbon energy transistors. What would be the, <laughs> the what would be the system level impact? You know, how, is that going to be a longer, better life? Is it going to be faster and so on? Mm -hmm. So you need these models to help you examine or uh, uh, the system level impact. And uh, and so those models are used and we actually use them along with our industry partners to understand, to assess if you did this kind of, make this kind of devices possible, what would the system performance would look like? So that's one question. The other kind of question we want to ask is uh, the other in the other direction is that if I change this device design, if I change the way I design the device, how would it affect the system level performance? And that's very useful for the device technologists because we need some guidance about what to do. Uh, of course, we have some inkling through our understanding of the device physics and how systems are designed. We have some inklings about uh, the um, the impact it may have, but then uh, it, to translate that inkling into quantitative numbers uh, requires a a a, a, a model to do uh, and a mod and a system to simulate that. Yeah, and I can see how this would improve the efficiencies of the fabrication process, right? Because you're modeling prior to fabricating, so you have a pretty good idea if it's going to work or not. Do you have a sense of what the percentage is uh, when, once you do uh, all of this modeling and you have these design tools that'll have some of this embedded in it as well? And then when you fabricate, you have a pretty good idea it's going to work. It, what What is that percentage or or can you quantify it in that way? Uh, yeah. Um, well, of course, when we, we, we as engineer, we started with uh, talking about modeling. But I guess uh, uh, your audience may be familiar with today another buzzword called digital twin. <laughs> and that actually is just digital twin. <laughs> right. It's a digital twin. Right. Exactly. It's a digital description of the physical world. Right. Right. It's basically a digital twin. And so 
being able to do make this model or create a digital twin is clearly important in, in terms of speeding up the development process because you can try things out very quickly <laughs> and uh, and also screen out a lot of ideas that you think well maybe that's good but well actually it's not <laughs> so you would save a lot of time to screen out things that don't work of course you would never find out things that actually would work by just modeling <laughs> you would have, you would need to build a real thing uh, uh it's just like you would never find out whether a product is uh is uh, well accepted in the market until you actually push it out Right. But you can do some estimation, <laughs> and you don't. You can just, you know, also do some focus group and know that oh, this is not going to work. <laughs> so it's the modeling is the same thing. Or digital twins is actually the same thing. And it helps you uh, screen out some of the possibilities that obviously won't work, but it won't tell you what will work. Uh, it would help point you to the right direction, but then the detailed work has to be done in the experiment. You know, that's, a, that's a, again, it's a really fascinating, but, you know, there's this integration of AI when you actually lay out what's going to happen when you fabricate. So between the two, uh, you can improve the results, right? <laughs> exactly. So this digital twin idea is just like a kind of like modeling on steroid. <laughs> You're able to model the entire world, how does it work? <laughs> Uh, and uh, so that's the, I think that's where the society is going and that's where technology is going. We are at a point where computers are extremely powerful. So right. even though you may have very complex uh, equations or very complex interactions between different parts, because oftentimes the complexity of the model is the complexity of the interaction between different parts. Right. right. So the, you have a... a basically an entire world you want to model and there's so <laughs> many moving parts. So the problem becomes extremely complex, but uh, fortunately computing uh, technology has advanced uh, tremendously. And uh, and uh, you want to be able to model a good part of the world uh, uh, in the future, in the very near future, I think. Yeah, precisely. So again, you know, transformational work definitely, definitely uh, drives all of the escalation we're we're getting and the and the rapid progress. You know, and you know, this brain inspired computing is. You know, I do keynotes and I've done them for a number of years and and to investors and CEOs and I've I've been keynoting on things like brain inspired computing <laughs> and you're doing such founded foundational work in this area. So can you tell, tell us about your brain inspired computing? I guess it's neuromorphic computing and things. Like yeah. That. Yeah. And it, they are kind of synonymous and I, and I don't know what the distinction is, but roughly speaking, you know, uh, a different kind of computing inspired by how the brain works uh, and how much you adhere to the reality of how brain work. It, of course, it's a, uh, <laughs> subject for uh, for you know dinner party <laughs> discussion but uh, generally speaking is kind of do computing inspired by how the brain works and i came into that uh, uh, quite a few years ago when DAPA started a project called the synapse and uh, some of the audience may be familiar with this and this uh, synapse project uh, has, uh, has many teams uh, participating in it and i was part of the team from ibm and that's by IBM Research, and uh, they eventually produced a chip called the True Knot. And uh, I wasn't, but I wasn't the part that uh, uh, that designed the True Knot. But within the bigger project of the Synapse project, there was a part that uh, tried to develop a uh, a electronic element that emulates the functions of a synapse in the brain. The brain consists of synapses and neurons. Synapses are basically biological structures that weigh the importance of the input signals and send them off to the neurons, which then sums up the in inputs from many synapses and determines to fire an output pulse or not. So the, and the brain has many, many synapses. The, the brain has about 10 to the 10th uh, neurons and about 10 to the 14th uh, uh, synapses. So there's a lot of synapses. And so uh, the idea is that if you were to emulate how the brain would do computation, then you would need a lot of these synapses. 
And since you need a lot of these things, and you, they must be have to be very small, otherwise it will be a very humongous brain, right? So, so it has to be very small. And so we set out the the IBM team and uh, um, asked me and uh, and uh, several other professors, including Kwabana Bohan, and uh, in the bioengineering department in Stanford, and said, "Hey, can we develop a uh, electronic device that emulates the function of a synapse?" And uh, so at the time, I had the students at a postdoc, uh, students of Rakesh Jaya Singh and uh, postdoc uh, Dugu Kuzum. Um, uh, Dugu Kuzum is now a professor in UC San Diego. Um, and so at the time, we, we set out to build an electronic device that emulates the function of the synapse. And there are some uh, high level abstraction of what a biological synapse, is, a synapse would do. And we took that. Because I don't know anything about biology, so I took that abstraction and say, okay, can I make an electronic device that produce the same behavior as that abstraction, that high level abstraction? And uh, after uh, some time, uh, the uh, my students and the postdoc uh, were able to pro to produce that, and uh, that was kind of like the beginning of a field of research in which. Um, we would like to find electronic synapse, uh, electronic uh, analogs of these biological synapses. Of course, the first version that we built is just a an example. There are many other physical systems that could that potentially could do the same thing. And so that was the first work that showed people that hey, you can use electronics to reproduce this high level abstraction of what the biology would do. And then other people come in and say, hey, you do this with this device. Maybe my devices can do this even better. So there's a lot of these kinds of work going on uh, for a few years. And basically, people are competing to say, hey, this is about a better device in here. Um, so we continue to work on this, working on different types of devices. And the next level of research work beyond the single device is to say, Okay, we have one synapse, but the brain is 10 to the 14 synapse, right? So the synapse has to work together with other neuronal functions, how to find neuron fires and so on, how to activate them. So the next level of uh, research work is say, how do you string together a bunch of these synapses a, 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 as large as possible and as, and design circuits around it so that they would do actual functions that uh, that would be useful for us uh, to maybe do image recognition, do language uh, uh, identification, that kind of thing. And can you do something like that? So the next level of work is to string them together with circuits and so on. And that's what we have been doing uh, for the past few years of uh, putting, integrating these electronic devices together with computational elements and integrate them with a big chip and uh, to show that you can actually perform, for example, some neural network function. And one of the more recent work we've done, which was published a couple of months ago in Nature, is a chip that has uh, three millions of this RM uh, integrated with uh, compute logic uh, built with uh, CMOS transistors, and that could perform a variety of neural network uh, topologies and functions um, and to do tasks such as language, uh, natural language processing or image recognition and uh, and uh, uh, image recall, that kind of uh, tasks. And so that's the kind of work that we have been doing in the last few years. Basically, take the um, take the uh, individual electronic devices that emulate biological functions and put them together into bigger systems. And to, the goal is really to start a twofold. One is to find out whether this method of, of computing is actually more energy efficient than the way we're doing things today. Uh, obviously, this is a method that is different from what we're doing today in our own computers and cell phones. But as I said last time, being different is not the same as doing being better, right? So we need to show that it's actually better. And I think the story continues today. I don't think we have an answer yet. Uh, the story continues. And there's a lot of research work in the community to, um, to figure out 
uh, whether this new way of computing is actually better than the conventional way of computing. Uh, so that's one, one direction of research. The other direction of research is really to figure out where, whether the non-idealities of the devices that we make, all devices have non-idealities, they're not perfect, right? They're non-idealities. Whether those are non-idealities are, uh, we can mitigate those uh, non-idealities to make the uh, to make the system function better. And so that's uh, a combination of uh, uh, device level uh, advancements, improving on the device itself, on the, understanding the physics and therefore improving the device itself or finding a better device also even. And then uh, of course, combine that with design and, and algorithm, uh, what we call co-design to make sure that we capitalize on the, uh, on the benefits of these uh, devices. And at the same time, uh, be able to mitigate the uh, non-desirable aspects of these, uh, of these systems. You know, I, I'm just thinking, I mean, you know, the basis of a lot of this work is, you know, like your early, you know, long time, you've been a proponent of yes. and, a, and a pioneer in phase change memory and metal oxide resistance switching memories of the RAM that you talked about. And you've got this open source SPICE RAM SPICE model as well. It's heavily downloaded. And then this, this is part of this work in your pioneer neuromorphic computing, your neuromorphic computing, the this idea of integrating electronic capabilities that simulate what's happening in the brain, and uh, and and you're able to solve problems <laughs> uh, using using these hardware. So I think it's uh, quite interesting. Yes, but so far we're just solving toy problems, right? We're just <laughs> we're at a very early stage of the game, and the and I just want to kind of just take this opportunity to energize the audience and saying that the opportunities going forward is tremendous. A brain burns about 20 watts. <laughs> and the computer that won the gold chess game, the Google computer that won the gold chess game, burns, I think, 170 kilowatts. <laughs> yeah, no. okay, so we have several orders of magnitude off <laughs> in terms of, uh, of uh, energy efficiency and so on. So this is a tremendous opportunity going forward. Uh, I'm not saying that this is the direction that we need to go, but then there's tremendous opportunity to be had because there is existence proof that you can do computation with 20 bucks. And that's <laughs> pretty powerful computation. Yeah, and, and we're running up against these power um, problems, right? I mean, data centers consume so much power and if you continue scaling on the cloud, we're just, we, there isn't enough power on the planet, right? In, a, in essence, or, you know, there's talk of the metaverse and the metaverse requires so much computational resources that again, you're going to have to come with paradigm shifting innovations, and really, you're leading on your uh, many these uh, foundational paradigm shifting innovations in RRM and, and your work in there. Yes. Indeed, it's, the way we're doing things are not scale at, at least at this point is not scalable to a future world in which right. we expect to, uh, uh, technology to solve many problems. Just to give an example, a study from MIT show that to train a language model uh, <laughs> that, that, that we use in Siri and things like that, to train a language model consumes uh, or produce the equivalent of carbon emission right. of right. a hybrid car that has 50 <laughs> miles per gallon going around the entire earth for 400 times. <laughs> That's the amount of energy it consumes to train a model. And, <laughs> And that's only one model. <laughs> and so we this is clearly not this is all for today's model, which is kind of, you know, it, do, it does something useful, but way, way less than what we expected it can do. Right? And so for a, a future world in which we have a metaverse and so on, we really need tremendous improvement in energy efficiency and that in computation, and that's so foundational to everything that we do. And uh if we uh, look into all the things that we wanted to do, they were all limited by the energy of computation. And uh, so that's finding solutions to that is really important uh, foundational uh, research that needs to be done. Yeah, and, and, and you know, you, you um, talk about the language models. I mean, GPT-3 is 175 billion parameters, but now they're exceeding a trillion. And, Already. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the prediction is next year that could exceed a, over a hundred trillion. And you know, exactly. So where do you find yeah. all the computational power to uh, to uh, train the model and to do inferencing and so on? And I would say I was joking with another uh, friend of mine the, the other day. Uh, we talk about metaverse, uh, M E T A, uh, metaverse, right? Like in metaphysics. But I think it should also be, we should also talk about metaverse, M A T T E R, <laughs> <laughs> physical matter. <laughs> Yeah, and it, you know, your your memory modeling and phenomenological understanding, scaling, and all of that is part of the solutions, right? And uh, that's why I think your your work is just so foundational and it, it's so it really inflection points throughout your entire career from your research at IBM and, and then continuing uh, afterwards. So you're always leading <laughs> in many respects. I, I want to shift gears a little bit too now, because you, you know you you have leadership positions at these multi-universe research centers of the National Science Foundation, the Semiconductor Research Corporation. You're a founding uh, faculty co-director of the Stanford System X Alliance, and you're a director of the Stanford uh, Nano Fabrication Facility. Can you talk about that work and why you you've taken on these leadership roles, and what do you hope to gain? Uh, in terms of the benefit of humanity and and really furthering the field by by working in these leadership roles with these alliances and groups and so on. Thank you for bringing us up. Uh, let's start local uh, at Stanford in here, and then we branch out to further. Right, locally at Stanford, uh, I I have taken the, uh, recent years taken up two uh, kind of uh, uh, responsibility. One is the, I'm the director of the Stanford Nano Fabrication Facility. This is a uh, shared facilities uh, uh, on campus that's shared not only among all the campus users, but also around the world. Uh, anybody who wants to come and use it, we can just pay up and then we can use it. And uh, <laughs> we don't own any of your IP or anything like that. You just come in and do your own thing. And, uh, and so we provide these infrastructures for people to do their research on nanofabrication, uh, making, yeah, from computer chips to micro devices to for biomedical devices or making strong nanostructures for batteries or building solar cells and things like that. Anything that requires the use of these, generally speaking, semiconductor in, uh, manufacturing infrastructure, fabrication infrastructure. Uh, the Stanford Nanofabrication Facility is probably one of the first such shared facilities, uh, I would say, at least in the US, perhaps in the world as well. And we started back in the 80s when I was still a graduate student. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was the, one of the, uh, the pioneering efforts of the uh, previous generation of faculty at Stanford who uh, came up with this idea that we need a shared facilities to uh, serve the, the broader community of people who can fabricate things. And that lowers because many of these fabrication uh, uh, processes requires tools that are rather expensive. That's number one. Number two, require, <coughs> requires uh, very knowledgeable staff to uh, develop processes and keep the tools running. And also, not only that, to pass on the knowledge of the fabrication processes from one generation of students to another generation of students. One thing that constantly uh, happens in the university is that we have a constant flow of students. By the time the students learn how to do things really well, <laughs> I'm gonna graduate. So right. we're always dealing with students that uh, do not have the skills and we just train them and then they would develop the skills go, uh, as they uh, move along in their, in, their, uh, in their education. So the having this infrastructure is tremendously useful because then uh, Many of the researchers do not need to own this very complex infrastructure, but then they can use that to their own research. And that's what the, one of the key points about these shared facilities. And uh, since that time, since the early 80s, when Stanford started these nano, uh, nanofabrication facilities, many universities around the country and also around the world have these guys, have developed these kinds of facilities as well. And, uh, and today, if you look into uh, in a broader scope, uh, uh, the what 
the people we'll be hearing from the CHIP Act, then they're talking about the you know, national infrastructure to enable laboratory to uh, manufacturing, what they call lab to fab uh, translation. Fab refers to the semiconductor manufacturing plants, which is typically called a fab. Uh, to enable that to fast translation. And it's the same idea, but at a bigger national scale that uh, uh, companies and researchers uh, that have good ideas that needs to be proven out uh, requires a uh, rather complex and expensive infrastructure uh, to prove out their ideas. And instead of everybody building their own thing, well, we can just come together in a common facility and do, and uh, which is well maintained, well kept, with knowledgeable staff uh, and to prove out the idea. So that's a starting from the 80s on this uh, shared facilities on the Sanford campus to today's national infrastructure that our President Biden is talking about. So that's an evolution of you know, several decades of uh, not all basically the assembly of the industry going from very simple uh, laboratory type demonstration to really much larger scale manufacturing uh, enterprise. So that's kind of um, the, uh, the sort of short story of uh, the Stanford Nano Fabrication Facility. And uh, as a faculty member here, I, I have myself benefited from the use of this facility for many years. And so when the dean asked me to take up this responsibility, I say, okay, that's time for me to give back. And so I will uh, pick up this responsibility here. Um, You've mentioned about the Systemics Alliance, which is quite also quite interesting. Um, many years ago, um, also back in the 80s, uh, at Stanford, uh, several faculty members came up with this idea of a center, uh, what they call it, they called it the Center for Integrated Systems. Uh, that was back in the 80s. And uh, at the time, systems were much simpler at the time, obviously. <laughs> and, uh, and and the Center for Integrated Systems is started out as a as an industrial PDH program. So they have uh, uh, companies come in to uh, uh, as members, and uh, uh, our faculty members which, and the students would show them the research work that we're doing and have a dialogue. Uh, really, uh, have a dialogue between industry and academic research, so that the students can learn from the companies. Uh, 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 members, what is important and what are they, what are they worried about? Why, what is their uh, product direction? So that they could then shape their research in a direction that is relevant to industry. And that's very important uh, because for engineering research, then uh, engineering is a practice. It's about practice, about making an impact broadly across the, the society. So that if you don't, don't doing engineering research without any knowledge about what companies are doing, that's kind of like really an ivory tower. <laughs> so we don't want to be an ivory tower. And so we engage the companies in this way. And that has gone on for quite a number of years. And at a time, uh, it's a reflection of how technology goes in the in the beginning the years of, uh, you know, of uh, semiconductor technology. A lot of the uh, advancements were driven from the bottom. Uh, you have a new device, you have a new uh, uh, new device technology, and then, then the application developer for that, okay, we got a new device, what can I do, what can I do with it? Right. And so they start with the bottom, namely the new device technology that came about, and then the people built applications around it. Um, in more recent years, it thinks that the, the world is somewhat changed in, in a sense that it's flipped the, flipped the other way around, in the sense that uh, we oftentimes now start with what you want to do uh, from a user application point of view. Do you want a VR, AR headset? Do you want a better phone? Do you want a self-driving car? Do you want uh, uh, robots to go around and, 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 and do things for you? Start from that, and then we ask, what kinds of technology do I need to develop to enable that? And that's a different think type of thinking. And so back in around, I think 2015 or 16, uh, Professor Boris Merman and I uh, think that, well, it's time to kind of re rework our thinking in this industrial affiliate program 
and we need we we realize that we need to more engage with companies that actually build the customer facing systems companies such as apple google facebook and so on and so forth amazon those companies who are built their customer facing uh, applications from there we would then derive the needs for all the technologies down uh, that is foundational to that application so turn this around and so we uh, revamped the whole uh, uh, industrial pH program and uh, and uh, called it System X Alliance and uh, start with the word system because we're starting yeah. from a pot and we call it an alliance because it is really an alliance. It's not a center of something because the center of something kind of connotes the notion that I'm the center of the universe. You all come here, <laughs> which is not true. It was really a it's really an alliance between uh, companies, uh, industrial practitioners, and the research work that goes on on campus. So it's an alliance. So that's why we call it Systemics Alliance. And by now, this has uh, grown into one of probably one of the largest uh, industrial finish programs on campus, and perhaps even around the country. Uh, we have 38 member companies, uh, companies from material suppliers uh, like Mitsui Chemical to companies who build systems, Google, Apple, Facebook, and so on. So the, so any, all this the entire system stack from the basic materials to the, the customer facing applications. So I think that's where the, uh, the engineering research will be going in the future that we will be all a lot a lot of the technology development will be inspired by the eventual applications and we have to stay for engineering research we have to stay very close to what the uh, end user application would call for you know and we touched on this in the first part of the interview too the uh, part one where you, you were talking about uh looking really at the application layer and then going sort of reverse down into the system on a chip where the system on a chip really encompasses the leads driven or the needs driven from the application layer. So, and that's an interesting perspective because then it's very efficient as well, right? I mean, you're really tailoring to what the requirements are. So I, again, I think it's just amazing work. I'm just going to do a bit of a time check here. Do you have a hard stop at uh, 3 p.m.? No, I don't. I'm okay. <laughs> okay. So, okay. That's good. Uh, this time I can go a little bit more. So I want to uh, cover two more chunks um, within your uh, marvelous uh, history. Um, one of which is you, you took a leave from Stanford from 2018 to 2020, and you took on a, a senior executive role at Taiwan Semiconductor. And really, it's the largest foundry in the world. Very, very famous. Uh, years ahead of other uh, foundries out there. And you still remain as chief scientist. Uh, that, that's just a fascinating work. What what really uh, drove your interest to even take on a role like that, and then for to continue to you know help in the innovation uh, of of this foundry. And then and, then, and uh, from what I understand, they're building uh, uh, complementary research or foundries in the U.S. Right in because of the U.S. Chips Act, which I think is such a foundational act in the United States. Any comments you can make, or maybe you can't, because you know it's 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 it's, it's a corporation and so on. So, absolutely happy to share uh, to the extent I can. Um, just to relate a short story. Yesterday, I was sitting with uh, several students. Uh, we have a regular uh, kind of uh, faculty students get together at lunch, and for students and to ask any questions you want. Right? And uh, for faculty, I was sitting in this uh, lunch yesterday. And the question, the one question come up and say, hey, um, the, what is the career path for students, uh, whether it should be academia or it should be industry? And, uh, and, and, and one of the comments that one of my colleagues said is that, well, we see this at Stanford, we see it as a continuum. Mm -hmm. uh, you go back and forth between two places, very kind of fluidly without any, uh, any uh, barrier. In fact, uh, you can see many, many examples. Right? Our Stanford faculty either found companies and uh, and uh, they go back into companies. There are many examples already. Uh, I don't need to name them. You all know them. 
<laughs> and uh, and uh, and many of them, do, after they found the companies, they come back and become faculty and do the academic uh, research and the education as well. So uh, this kind of going back and forth between industry and academia is perhaps uh, one of the more uh, distinguishing feature of our, uh, our engineering faculty here. And um, I think that is helpful in both directions. Uh, number one, uh, many of the uh, industry research really counts, especially now, really counts on really new ideas that uh, conventional way of doing things, you know, doing things as usual, business as usual, wouldn't probably won't get you anywhere uh, to give you a more uh, kind of visionary type uh, uh, product. But rather, uh, a lot of times, uh, 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 academics will bring new ideas to companies. At the same time, in the, in the in the opposite direction, when a faculty member come back from engagement with industry, he or she will bring back a wealth of information <laughs> from industry about what is relevant, what is where are the pain points, and uh, and so those knowledge are then uh, of course uh, 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 translated into to the students uh, through classroom or through their research projects and so on. It is kind of like a very beneficial interaction in both directions. And uh, and I don't think, at least in the case of engineering, uh, in the field of engineering, that I think uh, having a more totally academic view in a traditional sense is, is helpful. Uh, I, I think having this flow between academia and industry really helps in both directions. Um, going back to these earlier questions about uh, my, uh, my my sojourn in Taiwan, and uh, it's a very interesting uh, personal, uh, for my own sake, it's a very interesting personal journey. Um, I, I went to uh, Taiwan and worked at TSMC for two years, uh, to be exact, one year and nine months, and uh, uh, on leave on Stanford from Stanford. And of course, as you know, most universities allow faculty to be on leave for a limited amount of time and the Stanford one could be on leave for two years. So um, by the time I, uh, I, I took up that position in Taiwan, I, I have been at Stanford for, for 16 years already <laughs> uh, without taking a break. And that's kind of unusual. And I figured that hmm, maybe I should uh, take a break and learn something new. And uh, because technology evolved very fast, very rapid. And uh, between the time I left IBM, uh, that was six, uh, more than 16 years since, uh, <laughs> technology has moved tremendously. Uh, and, uh, and so the, when I left IBM, I was very familiar with all the semiconductor technologies in and out because I was at the forefront. I was the one who developed it. The, 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 the latest, uh, more future generations of technology. So I would really know what the industry is about, uh, is doing. But 16 years after that, I'm not so sure I still know too much about it. So it's time to get back and understand it. And, uh, and so that's part of the motivation. The other motivation really is uh, an opportunity for to make a difference. Uh, because as you know, most academics like to make a difference. <laughs> and um, my mission uh, at the company was to help them develop a, a their research organization. And uh, as you know, you have uh, to develop a new product. You have to really front end research work, which then we become translated into actual uh, pathfinding and product development uh, type work. And TSMC at the time has been extremely successful in uh, pathfinding and products development. But they realized that uh, because they are now at the front end of the pack now <laughs> in terms of technology, that it would be necessary for them to have a to have further headlights into the future. It's more just like driving in the fork and uh, you need to be able to see further uh, to allow them to stay at the forefront of technology. So but one of my missions was to uh, to, to help them build a, a research organization. And I find that rather intriguing that uh, to be able to help a, a kind of world leading company at a time already at the beginning of their world leading position 
to think about how to build a research organization. Now, um, the if you think about uh, industrial research, of course, you can think of like Bell Labs and IBM and RCA of the previous era, and then you have uh, TI, HP, and all these very uh, prominent Hitachi and Toshiba, all of these very prominent uh, industrial research lab. Now, of course, uh, when you build a, a research organization for this particular company, times have changed. It, Bell Labs, the, the, the era of Bell Labs of a monopoly and so on, and IBM with a monopoly of, uh, of mainframe computer, those are all gone. You, in, you would come to think of it, you cannot really build a research organization in the same way that Bell Labs and IBM build a research organization. It has to be something different. Now the question is, how? <laughs> what is different? What, what is it supposed to be? And that seems like a very challenging uh, question uh, to me. And and so I, I, I find it quite interesting. So the, I, I took up this uh, task and went over to Taiwan and and uh, started building the research organization for them. And that was really a fulfilling and rich experience. And I should say. And uh, after two years, uh, I have to come back to Stanford. Otherwise, I lose my job at Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> so, and of course, I love my academic job as well. And so the, and I come back to Stanford and I continue to interact with them on a consulting, uh, in a consulting role as their chief scientist uh, to this day. Yeah, and, and because of all the other work that you do with uh, you know these major companies and um, materials companies the, the, through the alliance and the other work, uh, you know you graduated forty eight PhD students and twenty four women and minorities, so you're very much a champion of diversity and inclusion and Absolutely. equity. So, but it, but because you're building all these pathways, it provides an opportunity when sometimes these companies will say, hey, do you have a student you can recommend or something like that, right? Yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm pretty proud of the fact that I can build my research group with more than, slightly more than 50%, maybe like 51% uh, uh, women and minorities. I'm pretty proud of that. I think it took some effort in the beginning <laughs> and to uh, to create an environment in, the, in which uh, non-traditional people, not, not, I wouldn't call it non-traditional, but, but people who are not obvious <laughs> be, be part of the system. And uh, over time, and I was as I was telling my colleagues that I don't feel my research or my career has been pull back in any way at all uh, by having these uh, engagements with the women and minority. In fact, I learned a lot more from them yeah, about yeah. Uh, organization and how to interact with people. And uh, it, it's really lovely to have these uh, students. And, and through this example, I show that it is possible to build a very vibrant research program with uh, attention to diversity and inclusion. Yeah, I mean, it, it, again, it's such a, a great model uh, for the world to follow. Now, I'm just going to set this up because I'm going to go into the awards and then that will be the last part, maybe some additional recommendations. But, you know, your, your work contributed to the advancements in silicon uh, CMOS, a complementary metal oxide semiconductor scaling, you know, carbon electronics. We talked about carbon nanotubes to uh, 2D uh, graphene and non-volatile memory and so on. And you pioneered these concepts and things like channel geometry and multi, multiple gate uh, electrodes to control short channel effects. And this enabled things like FinFET and nano sheet transistors. And I mean, the list just goes on and on, we, you know, with phase change memory and metal oxide resistive uh, switching memory. It, 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 you know, just so much foundational work, leadership work, foundational work, industry work, uh, these alliances. We talked about the Stanford System X Alliance and the Stanford Nanofabrication Facility and your work with students. And it just goes just so much uh, translational, but also um, transformational in terms of the world. And because semiconductor is so found foundational. But you won awards, and so I just wanted to talk about some of those awards. You know, like 
Uh, you're a fellow of the IEEE. In fact, the reason I'm interviewing you is the IEEE organization reached out and they said, you know what, there's this, this amazing uh, pioneer, his name is Philip Wong, and he's just received uh, this top award, the Andrew S. Grobe Award for contributions to novel and advanced semiconductor device concepts in their implementation, but you've also won the IEEE uh, Electronic Devices Society's highest honor, and that's rec recognizing outstanding technical contributions to the field of electron devices that made a lasting impact. And I mean, I mean kind of the list goes on, right? You know, um, all your your contributions. Can you talk about those awards and and where they fit in your career? And And, you know, what do you hope that the awards will enable you to do, uh, even perhaps it'll help amplify some of the thing, uh, key concepts that you want to get out or, um, you know, how do you integrate that into your career, these awards and recognitions that you're receiving? Well, thank you for bringing it up. First of all, I would really like to emphasize that even though awards tend to uh, honor a single person or few persons, it's really a collection of people and collaboration and work that led to the recognition of those technical work. Uh, and I should emphasize that I've been helped by many of my collaborators, friends, and colleagues at, at IBM, at Stanford, and also worldwide, uh, because this is the world, in many cases, a worldwide collaboration. And I should really emphasize that even though I was singled out as the reward recipient, it is really my friends and colleagues and collaborators that really make this happen. And I really appreciate that. I wouldn't be able to go into all the names that because it would take a long time. And uh, I'm sure that you know who you are. And I thank, really thank you for the collaboration. As far as the um, how it fits into the career, I think um, it. It is a uh, manifestation of, I think most awards uh, uh, kind of fall into this category that things that you've done at the time, uh, it wasn't that clear that it is <laughs> that it has some long lasting impact, but it would take years afterwards to realize that, oh yeah, this is what I what this work is about and how, this work sits into the broader uh, world of uh, technology advancement. And that goes true for the things that uh, I, I guess I've been recognized by uh, singled out as, uh, as the person to, to exemplify those, uh, those accomplishments. And, uh, and a lot of the work that we've done uh, on semiconductors, on, on transistors, we're done in a time when I was at IBM with many of the colleagues who contributed to the work. And at the time, it was just an idea that maybe this is where the technology will go. And there was no, clearly no idea that this will be the technology that will eventually become uh, implemented, become useful and so on. So, it goes through for many of the things that we do, and uh, the yeah, and so it appears that the the way technology evolves is completely unpredictable, yeah. and uh, also affected by many external forces, external environment, and so on. So the the only way we can do is to actively shape that environment and. Uh, and to us, the, the, the direction that we think is the right way to go. And that's way be, that's kind of what I've been spending a lot of my time on lately. On uh, You mentioned the Semiconductor Chips Act and, uh, and so on, which I believe is clearly a once in a lifetime opportunity for um, practitioners in our field in semiconductor technology to make an impact to the world. Uh, because semiconductor technology is so foundational to everything that we do, from self-driving cars, social media, VR, AR headsets, to personalized medicine and climate detecting and monitoring climate change and, uh, and making sure that we are energy sufficient and so on, economic security, national security, almost everything we do 
as I, as we you and I discussed, uh, uh, is foundational technology. And so we need really need to do this right, and um, and being able to form a alliance around the world to make sure that the not only we can continue on our present trajectory, but we also need to be able to ensure that we exceed our current tech, uh, technology uh, improvement trend, because otherwise it would take us too long to us to, uh, for us to achieve those goals. And so it's time, really time for the entire community uh, to come together and think about how best to collaborate and form alliances, not only in the US, but also across the nations to make sure that these technology advances is, are uh, facilitated and have low energy barrier and also have a very vibrant industry for future students to go into. Imagine if you were, uh, we were talking about, you know, there has been a lot of talk about workforce training. And uh, well, workforce training has two parts. One, the you provide the training. Two, you need to have the people who wants to have that training. <laughs> because if you don't have the training mechanism, but nobody wants to take that training, it right. doesn't achieve the purpose. So how do you make sure that there are people who wants to get that training is for them to realize that this is a industry or a discipline in which they could make an impact. They could have a good career. They could realize their career goals. They could, they could, utilize the skills and make contribution to the industry, to the world, to society, to broader society. So we really need to have a very vibrant uh, industry for potential students to say, hey, this is something I wanted to, uh, wanted to do because after I get done with this training, there are many opportunities and there are many career advancement opportunities. Whereas if you're on the opposite side, if you say, after I graduate, there's only two companies I can join. <laughs> not a very good, it's not a very good career. <laughs> so having a vibrant industry worldwide is very important. And having collaboration and free flow of information is clearly important. As I, I mentioned earlier, many of my research work are collaboration across different nations. The RM model I collaborate with are my friends in Peking University in China. And many of the uh, neuromorphic computing work, I collaborate with, uh, with uh, 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 research institutes across, in the, in, in, in the, across the US and also in Europe as well. So it's a worldwide enterprise and, uh, in terms of research and we need everybody to contribute and not just some regions to contribute. So going forward, I think, uh, what we need to do as a as an industry and also as our community is to really band together and not just think for ourselves and what we can do for our own uh, region or our own state, our own country, our own region, but rather how can we create a vibrant industry that could actually realize some of these technological advances that we expect to receive uh, that, that society will benefit from. Yeah, and I guess ultimately it's it's really for the benefit of humanity. And I, I mentioned Earth ecosystems, and your work is so foundational. And then just as a better reminder to the audience, it, it continues, including, and we talked about this, your carbon electronics and 2D layered materials and wireless implantable biosensors and directed self-assembly and device modeling and brain-inspired computing and non-volatile memory and monolithic 3D integration and more. So, and, and then all of this open source that you've been doing as well, because you're, you're trying to incentivize the industry, the world and students, and even the CHIPS Act has work, workforce development in there, right? It's embedded. Absolutely. So, so uh, you know, uh, Philip, uh, it was just a, a marvelous time I've had with you over these uh, two interviews. And I won't ask you for recommendations on this because the whole interview is full of recommendations. Uh, uh, but I just want to thank you for taking the time uh, for over two hours to, you know, talk about what's happening and how all of this is so important to the world, right, and its future. So thank you again for coming in. Thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. <laughs> 
Thank you for listening to the brand called You Video Cast and Podcast. A platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.